And can can you hear us? Thumbs up. Can I have a, a thumbs up if you can hear us okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Awesome. So I might just give it another couple of seconds. I can see a few more people joining in here. Okay, so hopefully that's everybody. So welcome to Native Plants and Gardening in the North. This is a partnership between the Magnetowan Watershed Land Trust and the Berks Falls Library. So we're really happy to have you today. Um, and without further ado, I'll introduce Mike from the Watershed Land Trust. Thank you so much, Cody. So it's masks on, masks off today. Um, and yes, thank you so much to the Berks Falls Public Library for partnering with us on this presentation. This is quite exciting. Um, as Cody mentioned, I work with the page down. How do I go to the next slide? Oh, just uh, over. Oh, uh oh. Cool. Sorry. Little technical difficulty. Little, little technical difficulty here. There we go. Okay, so little arrows at the bottom. Little arrows at the bottom. Okay. <laughs> As Cody mentioned, I work with the Magnetowan Watershed Land Trust. So the Land Trust is a not-for-profit charitable organization that's mission is to preserve the natural, historical, scenic, and recreational value of the Magnetowan River watershed for the benefit of future generations through a combination of land conservation, conservation easement, acquisition for the purposes of conservation and stewardship. Simply put, um, what we do is we purchase or accept donations of land to preserve in their natural state in perpetuity. So let's see if I can manage the screen here. There we go. So Cody um, is, is doing a, a really practical talk after my talk on seed saving. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to do a practical talk as well. I could make this really scientific, but I thought I will bring into it some of the experience I have in um, gardening with native perennials up in the Canadian Shield, which can be a little bit challenging at time. So let's start with a technical definition. What is a native plant? It's one that occurs naturally in Ontario or a particular region of Ontario, maybe in a particular ecosystem or habitat type in the province. And this is a key part prior to European contact. So that's the purest form of a definition of what a native plant is. It occurred here before we cut down the trees and built farms and roads and, and such. But you'll see the definition change a little bit as I go through this talk. So as I mentioned, I could do an entire talk just on the benefits of gardening with native plants. There are so many to talk about. Um, number one, they are adapted to our particular climate, our soils and our pests. Um, there are many times it goes down to minus 40 overnight in January, the roots of our plants will survive. They're used to the types of bugs and slugs that attack them up here. So they have their own defenses against them. They're used to nutrient poor soils by and large. And when you grow a native or a native plant grows up here, it supports local birds and butterflies and bees and other pollinators that are used to interacting with those particular plants. And of course, they add to the diversity of our local environment. As well, we get into more of the environmental benefits of gardening with native plants. So they don't typically require herbicides, pesticides, or chemical fertilizers. In fact, you'll find um, when you start to plant native plants on your property, at most you might wanna mix in a bit of a uh, well-rotted compost or manure into the local soil. And that's pretty much all the fertilizer that our native plants need. They're used to poorer soils. This will just give them an extra little boost, but certainly nothing else is required. You may find when you purchase or, or, or borrow or trade native plants from friends that they're called deer resistant or rabbit resistant. That doesn't mean that a deer or rabbit's not going to take a bite out of it, spit it out or step on it. It just means the plant tends to recover from that kind of browsing and abuse. It's not like some of our more sensitive horticultural varieties. You grow an oriental lily, for example, and the deer chomps the bloom off while well, it's done. Um, economical. Growing 
native perennials is highly economical because they produce a lot of seeds, a lot of them do, or they spread by roots. So you're constantly able to divide your favorite plants or seed save and grow your favorite plants from seeds or scatter them around your property as opposed to having to buy more and more plants every year. And because they're perennial, they tend to be longer lived. Um, some live 100 years, but others are maybe three to five years. They don't live forever, but you get blooms year after year out of most plants. So from a practical perspective, I thought I'd talk a little bit about my experience gardening up here. Some of the key things I've looked for over the years are plants that are shade adapted. You may have lots of garden plots on your property that have full sunshine, but you might also have around the edge of your property lots of trees where there isn't as much sunshine for certain plants. And because typically this was a heavily forested area hundreds of years ago, you're going to find plants that can tolerate quite a bit of shade, which is nice. Um, there are also going to be plants that can tolerate nutrient poor soils and of course they're cold adapted. They can handle the conditions that we have up here. So the first thing I think about when uh, gardening with native perennials is mimicking nature. I'm not thinking of putting in a big raised garden bed full of blooms. I'm thinking of looking at those little corners, those little pockets of my property where there are no flowers. There's nothing growing. There's no blooms. There might be a fern or, or a shrub, but you know, there's always a spot for more blooms. So I look um, based upon the needs of the flowers, how much sun they need, how much moisture they need. I try and figure out um, where to plant them. There are some examples of, of highly adaptable plants like the Eastern Columbine, which can grow just about anywhere in any type of soil. But by and large, most plants do have some sort of preference. You'll see full sun, full shade, and somewhere in between. And it's the plants that grow somewhere in between that are the most fun to work with. They generally like a lot of sun, but they can handle a lot of shade or vice versa. When it comes to um, soil moisture, I find most of the plants that I work with like well-drained soils, which is great up here on the shield because we've got a lot of rock, a lot of gravel, a lot of sand. So no matter how wet it gets, the water will drain away fairly quickly, which means the roots of the plants won't rot. Oops, I went back. And let me just see if I can go back one slide. This one. I may have to call for help. There it is right there. I see it. Okay. So mimicking nature, the type of gardening I'm suggesting for um, on the Canadian Shield up here for perennial gardens is to imitate nature in that you're going to have pockets of gardens around the property. This is the way it would happen in nature. So typically there would be a big storm and a lot of trees would blow down, therefore opening up the, the ground to more sunshine or one large tree would fall over or maybe even a small forest fire. So typically you would see up here hundreds of years ago, little pockets of blooms here and there, wherever the sunlight was able to get through. And I call that pocket gardening. And that imitates nature in a way that a garden bed with hundreds of annuals just can't quite capture. So in this picture here, I've got, I found a spot on my property that already had um, a lot of native plants growing. Um, I think it had some trillium, some violets, some forget-me-nots, some other native plants, but not a lot. So I simply put a border around it using birch bark logs and I called it a garden. And then I started thinking about what other native plants might go in there. A lot of our native plants are done blooming very early in the season. So I popped in some woodland sunflower native to my area, native to this area. And so in late August, we've got huge blooms growing in this little pocket garden off on the side of the woods. These gaps in the forest are what our pollinators are looking for. So historically, hummingbirds, bees, butterflies would be looking for little gaps in the forest. They know that's where they're going to find some blooms for nectar and for, for pollen to feed upon. So you're basically imitating um, nature and attracting those uh, birds and pollinators to your area simply by adding in some of the blooms. So again, most plants, oh, I went back, I love this thing. Okay, so there are a number of different gardening styles. 
don't be afraid to have um, really formal garden beds around your house and then do the perennial pocket gardening on the periphery of your property. Um, it's a really nice contrast and it supports a, a great greater diversity of uh, bees and bugs and butterflies, different pollinators, because if you have a, in your formal garden, you probably have blooms right from the spring into the fall, whereas in your pocket gardens, it might be hit or miss for some of the wildlife. So where to start? So what I did was I, I, I gathered a few native plants that I got from friends and from nurseries, and I started in a nursery bed, a real good location where I knew I could weed out the weeds and I could make sure they were well watered, got the right amount of sunshine, and just watched how they grew and watched how they spread. And from there, I was able to harvest off um, baby plants and, and seedlings from all of these and gradually push them maybe beyond their limits a little bit. This, this photo in the bottom here, it's my throwaway bed. It's the place where I take the cuttings from the garden in the fall and, and uh, toss them on a brush pile along with roots and what have you. And by no means of my own, um, one year we had a bunch of bee balm blooming in absolute full shade. Now this is not a sea of blooms, but there's you know five or six here. And I thought this is a perfect location to harvest seedlings from because they've grown on my property generation over generation and have somehow become very, very shade adapted when typically they aren't. And I've been using the seedlings from this patch here to put in, in shadier areas and they're doing very, very well. Whereas if I went to a garden center and, and bought a, a plant that loves full sun and stuck it in a shady corner of my property, it's not gonna do so well. You have to, one word of caution, you have to satisfy yourself with fewer blooms if you're gonna bloom, do pocket gardening and woodland gardening, but that's, it's better than no blooms, I always say. And the last thing is learn to love the plants that spread and are a bit aggressive. They're the ones you're gonna get the seedlings from. They're the ones you're going to be able to divide. So in the end, I garden a lot with uh, bee balm, which you see here, as well as the black eyed Susans because of all the seeding they spread, as well as the very, very, very aggressive native woodland sunflower, which will take over your garden, but is great for spreading around your property, around the periphery of your property. So now I'm going to try and categorize things a little bit better. So native plants, locally native plants, the, the, the real true definition of, of, of native plants. These are the ones that were here hundreds of years ago. They're highly adapted to the area. They're probably growing wild in your backyard right now. So a lot of these tend to be early bloomers. Think the pink lady slipper that we have here. They tend to bloom when the leaves aren't on the trees yet and they're getting the full sunshine, the full spring sunshine, and they're able to do really well. And then they die back slowly over the course of the season as things get warmer and the leaves start to grow on the trees. Trilliums are a very good example of this. We have five different types of trilliums in the province. The one on the left is the white trillium. The one on the right is the painted trillium. We are not supposed to go out and dig up native plants and, and move them into our gardens. That is considered a no-no. However, I will say that the plant on the right, the painted trillium, um, was basically eliminated from the area around my house and my driveway when it was first built 50 years ago, but was growing in profusion on the rest of the property. So I have been selectively moving small groups of these trilliums from large patches to smaller patches closer to the house so that you can enjoy them from the kitchen window and the front door because I can tell you that when the painted trilliums are in full bloom, the black flies are also in full bloom. Columbine, this is one of my absolute favorites. It's native. It's our only native columbine. Um, not super easy to grow from seed, although I have, but it's a friend said, if you take the seed and spread it in the areas where you want it to grow, you'll have much greater success. It's very popular with pollinators and very forgiving of just about any type of soil. And it's an early blooming native perennial. We also had a, a lot of late blooming native perennials these are the ones that take advantage of the gaps in the forest, places where trees have fallen down, clearings. You see them alongside the, the edges of the road um, and uh, driveways and such. So this one here is Joe Pieweed. <clears throat> Excuse me, frog my throat. This one here is called Joe Pieweed. Purplish brown flowers, very beautiful. Didn't do all that well in my garden. So instead on the advice of a friend, I went out to a ditch. I grabbed a whole bag of seed heads in the fall and I chuck them in a ditch at the base of my driveway and three years later, four years later, it's a sea of purple and who would have thought a ditch was a good place for a garden? It looks fantastic. 
asters. Asters are a big one. Um, they can handle quite a bit of shade. You often see them growing up against the trees on the roadsides or the edge of farm fields. There are so many varieties. They'll grow in full sun, they'll grow in shade. They're a great pop of color at the end of the season. And they're really um, valuable for, for late season pollinators. So think of the, the last group of monarch butterflies as they come out of the chrysalis in the fall and have to migrate all the way to Mexico. They're looking for nectar, they're looking for pollen, and the asters are a very, very good source of that for them. So again, a great plant to look at. Goldenrod, I'll skim over this one. I don't know why I put it in. I wouldn't advise it. Um, they say that the showy goldenrod won't take over, but I still don't trust it. Maybe if you have a, a dusty, dry, gravelly corner of your property, why not try some goldenrod? Regionally native plants. These are the ones that we typically think of native plants. These are the workhorses of our wildflower gardens. Um, they don't they didn't typically grow this far north. They're a bit more of a prairie species. Eons and eons ago, after the last ice age, this area of the world got a little bit hotter and drier than it is now. And the prairies actually moved into Southern Ontario, into Southwestern Ontario, and brought a lot of these prairie species with them, Echinacea being one of them. Um, times changed, the world got a little cooler and a little wetter, and remnants of these flowers were left behind. And the First Nations people would actually do burns to keep the grasslands open so the deer would come in so there were more deer to hunt. And that helped to preserve these species in Southern Ontario. This far north, Magneto on Berks Falls, they didn't typically occur, but since Europeans have moved here and opened up farmland, I think they're perfectly suited for this kind of habitat. And like I said, they end up being the workhorse of many of our gardens. You will recognize many of them, the Echinacea. There's quite a few varieties in the Echinacea family. Um, they're great for pollinators and they bloom for like almost two months at a time. Rebecca, the black-eyed Susans, the brown-eyed Susans. There are examples of these that are annuals, biennials, and perennials, but you would never know it because these little guys seed so aggressively that they come back year after year after year. And I've used that to my advantage of my property and that I'm always finding little seedlings everywhere, usually in really obnoxious locations like where you want to mow or where you're about to walk. So I dig those up and put them in better locations. And again, they're adapted to my property, to my local conditions, the climate, the temperature, the soil types, because this plant is probably the great, great, great grandchild of the plant that I first put on the property. And so they've adapted. Only the seeds that like the growing conditions on my property have survived to produce other seedlings. That's something to remember. Liatris or blazing star, this is another prairie plant. They don't like shade as much as the echinacea do or the, or the rudbeckia do. So full sun for these guys, but they're still really valuable. They really attract the pollinators and um, they tend to bloom when some other flowers are kind of finishing up. So this is where I'm going to stretch things a little bit and expand my definition of a native plant just a little. So my opinion only, if the plant is native to Eastern North America, it is not invasive and it actually attracts local pollinators and it's beautiful, put it in your garden. I think there are so, it expands our, our um, opportunities to plant so many different plants up here. And I'm just gonna give you a few fun examples. This one's called Queen of the Prairie. She can grow six, seven, eight feet tall in the right conditions. She's getting strangled here in my garden by the woodland sunflower, but you'll notice there's nothing else in bloom. It's just her. So it's a perfect plant to fill in some of those little gaps in the season when nothing else is actually in bloom. The fringed poppy mallow. This is a delicate little one. The only way I got this to survive in my area was I grew it from seed. I put it in a nursery bed where it had no other competition. It had lots of mulch. It got watered when it needed it, got weeded when required. And once it was big enough and strong enough, I then transplanted it to the edge of a, a little pocket garden where it had a space all to itself. And since then it has bloomed, produced viable seeds and seeded down and produced new plants that I've been able to move around the property. So, we're talking about perennial plants and I'm going to be a little bit bad here and I'm going to talk a little bit about filling out your, your pocket gardens, your woodland gardens, your pollinator gardens with plants that aren't necessarily native. All you have to do is make sure that they're not invasive, that they attract pollinators, and that they can handle the conditions in which you're planting them in. So Bleeding Heart, Dicentra, it's an early bloomer. It really, really attracts the hummingbirds. It looks really great against your native ferns. 
And by the time the heat of summer rolls along, it withers and dies back to the ground and then pops up the next spring. A stillbe, this is actually a cousin of the queen of the prairie, and I know of no other perennial flower that blooms so well in full, full shade. It looks, uh, it's a great addition to a woodland garden, and um, it attracts the really small pollinators, the little flies, the little wasps, another great addition to your property. And foxglove, it's beautiful. The bees love it. It produces so many seeds. You can scatter them in those dry, dusty, shaded areas of your property and see what comes up. I'm running out of time here, so I'll wrap up. One last word, you never know what to expect with a perennial garden, no matter how you garden, because they are ever changing. One plant will take over one year, another the next. Some will try to get out of your garden. Some seed will come in from another plant. And from one year, it could be this. And the next year, it could be this. One final plug before I pass this off to Cody. There's this amazing new resource from Birds Canada. It's called birdgardens.ca. They have a searchable database of 500 plus plants and they tell you which birds these plants attract. Another great resource for using up here for increasing our biodiversity. And off to you, Cody. I hope I didn't go over time. No, that's perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. So um, there we are. Okay. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about when to plant what to plant, and then an introduction to seed saving and to our seed library. So when to plant. Um, according to the Farmer's Almanac, the last frost in our area is June 3rd, and the first frost is September 8th. So this gives us a 96 day growing season, which is quite short. So to extend that growing season as much as possible, um, you're gonna wanna start your plants indoors and just use the back of your seed packet to tell you how to do that. And then um, always be prepared for frost. So keep an eye on the local weather reports, but never take it as an absolute truth. Um, always have that old sheet ready to run outside and cover your plants. My mom is out there at all hours of the night. <laughs> uh, what to plant. So stick to 90 day vegetables if you can. Look for native varieties, heirloom and non-GMO seeds. So these types of seeds are safer for our pollinators, but they're also more reliable when saving seeds. And ensure you get a crop by purchasing whole, cold hardy uh, plants like snap peas, beets and carrots. And then a little plug, uh, Midlothian Valley Farm are local growers in our area, and they are a fantastic place to get seed varieties that have been tested in their own gardens. And they actually garden out at Peter Kamarni's Screaming Heads. So they're a really great resource. Keep track. So create a gardening notebook and fill it with seed packets, useful articles, notes. Um, how did your veggies taste? How did they keep? How did they preserve? Um, and then remember that for when you're saving seeds and gardening for next year. This helps ensure that you will have a hardy crop for the next growing season. So an introduction to seed saving. We have annual, biannual, and perennial. So not all fl plants flower, seed, and die in a single growing season. Um, those that do, like lettuce, tomatoes, and peppers are called annuals. Uh, biannuals, such as carrots and onions, don't flower until their second growing season after they've gone through that cold period. And then some long-lived plants like apple trees and asparagus are perennial, so they survive and flower for many years. And what to save. So start with easy crops. Some crops like peas, beans, and pumpkins are really great for beginning seed savers. These annual crops only require a few plants to reliably produce seeds and then save from heirloom non-GMO crops. This guarantees you a reliable seed and crop for the following year. If you try to garden with um, GMO varieties that you've maybe gotten from the grocery store and you've tried to save seeds out of a squash, they, they're not always as reliable for producing the same kind of fruit the next year when you plant them. And then look out for hybrids. So pumpkins and squash are some of my favorites to grow. But they love to cross pollinate. And uh, if you are growing a pumpkin and a squash next to each other, you might get something a little different when you plant that seed next year. 
and grow extra. Some crops have a hard time producing seeds when there are too few plants around, um, and then others can reproduce with just a single plant. So you really need to do your research about what you're growing, um, and you might need a bit of a larger crop. And then also grow extra for seed saving. In most cases, you can have seeds or you can have edible fruit, but it's really difficult to have both. And know when your seeds are mature. In many of our favorite crops, the seeds are not mature when the fruits are ready to eat. So this means that seed, saver, seed savers need to leave a few plants to fully mature in the garden. So those tomatoes that you love, you might have to leave on the vine a little longer. Sorry, just have a little notification from Zoom here. <laughs> okay. Um, and every plant is different. So if you do your research, uh, find out when a fruit has reached maturity and the best seed saving practices for each variety. And then know how to harvest seeds. So we have dry fruited varieties and wet fruited um, and collecting seeds from dry fruited crops like wheat or peas can be really simple. Just go out to the garden and you can kind of see when they're dry uh, and ready to be harvested. But wet fruited crops like tomatoes are more difficult. So they need to be picked when their seeds are mature, which is past the point of uh, being able to eat them. Um, and then they have a bit of a, a different way to save seeds. So tomatoes and cucumbers, um, you really need to do that research and figure out exactly how to save the seeds. And storing seeds. Seeds are kept best in a cold, dark, and dry place. A dark closet, um, a cooler part of the house, a dry, cool basement are all good places to store seeds. Now, just remember airtight container because I have uh, I've made the mistake and had mice get into my seeds before so keep that in mind. Um, once properly dried seeds can also be stored in an airtight container and in the refrigerator or freezer for several years and just keep in mind that some crops are naturally longer lived than others so uh, you'll probably want to test the germination of the seeds and make sure that they're still viable. And then don't forget to label your seeds with crop type, variety name, all those useful notes. I always think to myself that I'm going to remember what that seed is, and I don't always, so just keep that in mind. Um, and introducing our seed library. So the Berksville Seed Library makes gardening accessible for all by providing informational workshops, reference materials, and a free seed savers exchange. The library promotes sustainable gardening and seed saving practices. And our motto is take a seed, save a seed, leave a seed. And here are a few pictures of our, our seed exchange and seed library over the years. We always have a nice big vegetable crop right outside the library. So how does it work? Take a seed. So whether you're a master gardener or a beginner, we encourage you to borrow seeds from our Seed Savers Exchange to plant in your garden. Save a seed. It's the responsibility of the gardener to save the seeds from the plants once they've fully matured. On the back of each seed packet, um, we provide simple instructions for harvesting seeds. And then leave a seed. Once you have harvested the seeds from your plants, we ask that you save a few for us. Um, by returning seeds to the exchange, you make it possible for the library to grow our seed exchange and you allow other gardeners and members of the community to get involved. So how can you get involved? Sign our membership form and join the Seed Savers Exchange. Follow us on all of our social media and spread the word about our seed library, and then participate in events like this and workshops. Um, and you're welcome to call me at the library for any information. All right, so um, now's the time for questions. So if you have questions for me or for Mike, you're welcome to turn your mic on and, uh, or drop it in the chat and let us know. Oh, thanks, Barry.
I have a question. Mm -hmm. Here I am. There I am. <laughs> Um, I just have a question about leaves. We have a, a lot of leaves on our property and I'm just wondering what you recommend about whether you should rake them or not rake them. They're, they're mostly maple leaves, but we do have a lot of, I guess, a few other plants. I, I like putting them on my gardens, although they don't rot away in the full winter season. If you can mulch them up a little bit before you put them on. Maple leaves are very nutrient high and they also add hummus to the garden. So yeah, especially if you have a bit of a dry garden bed, it's best to have the leaves on there. It also protects the seedlings early in the spring when you get that late frost or that late snowfall like we did this year. Um, it's nice to have that wet leaf layer there. It protects them when they come up. It's a bit messy, but it helps. And so later on in the spring, do you recommend that we break them up? Like I'm just worried about stifling any undergrowth. It, it, it shouldn't too much. They're used to growing up through it, but you can, you can rake it away to the edges of the bed, I find. That way they can still break down close to where it, it's required. Okay, thank you. So we have a couple of questions in the chat here. Is periwinkle considered invasive? Periwinkle is awful. It is awful, awful, awful. Please get rid of it. It's so hard to get rid of. Um, we made the mistake of getting a few plants from a friend and I spotted the periwinkle coming up. Seven years later, I'm still pulling the periwinkle out because if left unchecked, it can cover huge areas. And it, it can actually get into fairly healthy forest areas and cause problems there. It's one of our checklist of bad plants. It's really hard to get rid of though, if you have it, just do your best to contain it, I'd say. And then someone else has asked, what plants are okay over my septic? They generally recommend, I, I wouldn't put any. I know a friend who put a whole wildflower garden over her septic and she really, really regretted it. It looked beautiful. Throw some crocuses or some daffodils on there or violets. I would try violets. They're low growing. Yeah, probably any low growing native ground cover. Violets are a good one and they'll spread and you can mow them. <laughs> does, Mike, does Mike do tours of his garden? Oh God, no, it's a mess. <laughs> Um, no, it's, I'm, I'm a bit of a novice. Um, it's, I, I actually live in Lake Bays, so it's a long, long way from here. It's about an hour drive. Um, but thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was wondering if people are having success growing clover instead of grass. Um, I have a neighbor that does that. She does clover instead of grass and she loves it. Now I will say it's not as forgiving as grass. She had some younger children come over and just flatten her clover and it didn't pop back as nicely as the grass would. Um, but it is a great option when you, yeah. yeah. It, it adds nutrients to the soil. Mm. All right, any other questions? Oh, are dry pine needles okay for gardens? Yeah, they're a good mulch. They're a good, I find them to be quite a good mulch. A lot of our, well, certainly our native plants are, are used to very acidic soils. Mm -hmm. So, and this, they add acidity to the soil. If you've got a particular type of plant that doesn't like acidity, then no, but that would be certain species of hydrangea or something like that. Where do you recommend getting wildflower seeds? So I get the, my seeds from the, um, Aurelia Wildflower Farm. They, it's all mail order. They've got a great online um, program. Um, they even have a book out. The author has a book out. So they're very good. Um, not always easy. Some are, are easier than others. I find, you know, certain plants you can grow very easily from seed and others are challenging. Um, I do have it recording. This will be my first time trying to share a recording. So we'll see how that goes. But, uh, but yes, there is a recording. Um, so someone's asked what varieties of clover are native slash non-invasive invasive, and what other shade ground cover to use? I don't think clover is typically native. A lot of our good grasses, the, the grasses for pastures and so forth, came from Europe because our grasses were woodland grasses, which don't offer the nutrients. Um, there's prairie species. Um, some of them are quite invasive. The, the tall white ones are, are, can be quite invasive in terms of clover. You'll find them everywhere because we have farm fields up here. Um, ground cover. I'd have to, I know there's I'd, for non-invasive, I'd have to do a bit more homework because a lot of them are meant to spread. That is their whole purpose. I know a lot of people use um, walkable moss. Um, violets, if you get a non-native violet, they can spread really, really aggressively and actually get into areas of your property you don't want them. And that's a hassle to get rid of. Um, 
I get online and I do some research because I wouldn't want to steer you in the wrong direction. Mm. And someone's asked, um, can you comment on balsam and their effect on the earth below them? So all conifer trees um, have shallow roots and they're very greedy for water and nutrients. So if you're planting any plants um, close to conifer trees, they're gonna need more water than they normally would and a bit more natural fertilizer. There's this, I use this chicken occasionally, this chicken poo pellet fertilizer, I, I, that's very slow release and safe to use. And um, yeah, conifers, evergreen trees can be very greedy and they'll take, more plants die under conifers due to lack of water than lack of sunlight, apparently. Hmm. All right, do we have any other questions? Oh, thank you, you're very welcome. What about fertilizer? Fertilizer, I, again, um, a good compost or a manure when you first plant a plant is great. And otherwise that, you know, they call it, um, it's chicken manure, hen manure. It's sterilized, it's in pellets. And if you have a large property, you can broadcast it the same way you would chicken feed. And that's good for a month. Awesome. And I think we are at our time here. So thank you so much to everybody for joining. I really appreciate it. And thank you to and Mike thank you to the Burks Falls Library. And we hope to do more. We're going to do one on B hotels yes. and it looks like maybe June 17th yes. in the evening. Yeah. So more people can participate. Mark that on your calendar. 7 p.m. June 17th. Bees. Awesome. Thank you so, much, so much, everyone. Thanks, Cody. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Barry. Y'all take care, everybody. Be safe.